Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. Today, myself, Alan, and my colleague here, Gareth. Hello. Today we're talking about One Foot in the Grave, a 90s classic. It's hard, it's hard to believe we've got to this. <laughs> I, I don't believe it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Let's get that. laughs> Can we not do that again? <laughs> Pathetic. Oh God. I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm relieved that we got through that. We got it, we got it out of the way. We'll yeah. just get it out of the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so yes, we're talking about One Foot in the Grave today. Um, this is going to be a, a, a quite an interesting one, I think, because, to, well, to get sort of straight into it, it, it's not a show that particularly deals heavily with social and cultural issues. Which is kind of what we do here. Mm-hmm. We kind of look at we look at sitcoms in their kind of historical place. So it's going to be interesting to to sort of place this one. Like this was made started in nineteen ninety, ran all the way to two thousand. But really, that kind of early nine early to mid nineties yeah. is it's what it's representing, I suppose. But could it be made again today? Could you do the same thing today? Could it have been made in the seventies? Uh, well, I think we'll 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 get into that. I think it'd be okay. interesting to see how that all falls in. But first of all, uh, Gareth, you being a little bit older than me would have been much more aware of this show when it first came out. Yeah. So do you have any memories of it at the time? It's interesting how it sits in my memory because, yeah, it was, well, I was 15 when it started and kind of 20 when it, when the main series finished. My memory of it when it launched was that it was just another mainstream BBC sitcom. Yeah. But... Historically, when people look back at it, it's more of a cult classic. And yeah. I think that started to happen whilst it was still on. That's not with hindsight. Mm. Apart of researching for this podcast, we were watching various YouTube clips. And there was, yeah. there was a clip of Richard Wilson in character as Victor Meldrew on The Big Breakfast with Zig and Zag. And I mean, there's nothing more 90s than Zig and Zag. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Well, your well-known catchphrase is, I don't believe it. What exactly don't you believe in? I don't believe you're real for a start. Huh? Oh, I'm an alien. You what? An that alien? You look like a bloody alien. Oh, no. hey! oh. Why? That's my brother and you. It's your don't brother. Be... Yeah. Oh, I thought you were living together. No, we're. Oh. What? We are identical twins. I, you're not identical. We are. We are identical twins. <laughs> and then he's purple and green in your bra. I don't. Besides that, we're identical yeah. twins. Rubbish. Watching that clip, it's I, I basically spent the day watching One Foot in the Grave and enjoying it. And then I watched that clip and I thought, oh yeah, it was the 90s, wasn't it? So <laughs> it, it, it sort of sat it back into context and into time because, you know, yeah. the big breakfast was very much of its time. But One Foot in the Grave was not of its time, particularly. <laughs> it was just, it was yeah, just exactly, a, yeah. a sitcom. Yeah, I think... That is partly because, obviously, you're dealing with older characters, you're dealing with characters who are supposed to be in their 60s. Hmm. So they're not going to be in the latest fashions, the latest trends. They're not trying to keep up with the 90s. No. But also, it's written by someone in his 40s, so perhaps it doesn't age them up quite so much as it might do otherwise. So it's not really harking back to the 70s or something like that when they were younger and in their prime. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I think it's just one of those slightly out of time shows, and and I don't think there's a problem with that. Uh, I think, in fact, that's probably helped its legacy in some in some respects. The fact that it's still twenty yeah. years, I think, 30 if years one after foot in the grave had never existed, it could go on now, and it, people would enjoy it in just the same way as they did yeah. thirty years ago. Yeah, a few little differences, you know, little things like a mobile phone, for example, or you know, there's there's the odd little thing. But even that, even watching the show, there's not even a lot of stuff like where you go, oh my God, do you remember them? Eh? Yeah. Except they have like a telephone with an, an, yeah. connected to the house <laughs> with an answer yeah. machine, you know, apart from that. Are we saying already that this is a timeless classic? <laughs> I think that's what we're saying, yes. <laughs> well, it's timeless, but is, is it no, any good? We'll, we'll get to the rest of it, yeah. Okay, so I, I'll give you a bit of sort of a prehistory to One Foot in the Grave. Uh, and and really, that's the history of David Renwick, who is the writer. Yeah. Basically, he, you know, pretty standard kind of young writer, sent some sketches off to the BBC radio or whatever, and basically became a jobbing sketch writer. Sketches. Okay. 
And in a writer's room, you know, working along with other people, he met a guy called Andrew Marshall, who he be- they started writing together all the time, which seems to be quite common in comedy, um, yeah. writing partners. So they they wrote on The Burkis Way, uh, which was a Radio 4 show in the late 70s. Right. They wrote Whoops Apocalypse that was a on movie, TV. Wasn't it? They did a film version of it, I think. Okay. And then they did a, a show in the late 80s called Hot Metal. Was that about newspapers? That's right, yeah. It's about a, a tabloid newspaper. I, I, I've got a vague recollection of that. Yeah, I don't think it was like a huge show, but it did okay. Um, notably in that, um, it was Jeffrey Palmer as kind of one of the leads in that, and, and then he left. So in the second series, he was replaced by Richard Wilson. Uh, basically sketch writers, uh, a sketch writer, and then started doing a bit more. And then threw his hat in the ring for a full full-blown sitcom it got commissioned and around the same time andrew marshall his writing partner wrote uh, and got commissioned 2.4 children that's his oh, okay. kind of main thing which certainly hasn't stood the test of time in the same way <laughs> so suddenly david renwick is on his own he's got a sitcom commissioned and that is one foot in the grave now in terms of casting obviously he had worked with Richard Wilson previously on Hot Metal, mm-hmm. and I think in some other things, like sketch things and stuff, but he wrote the part for Richard Wilson. Okay. But in this case, it wasn't that straightforward. They offered it to Richard Wilson, and he turned it down. Is he waiting for the call from Hollywood? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who do you think you are, Richard Wilson? Like, this is the lead in a major sort of BBC <laughs> sitcom, you know, with a writer you've already worked with. It's written for you. Like, who do you think you are? Come on. <laughs> like, you're a jobbing TV actor, right? Um, it would definitely have been the biggest part of his career to that point. But the way he explains it, he was like, when he read it, it was just like, ah, I don't like it because it's just a man being angry all the time. <laughs> and I don't particularly like that. But reading between the lines, the impression I got was Richard Wilson was about 52, I think, 53. The character is 60. And mm-hmm. I don't think he was quite ready to accept that he was playing older men. I see. Uh, in, that, in that sense. That's the impression I'm getting from it. That maybe there's a little bit of vanity and a little bit of pride. A slight, that's a little bit of um, supposition on my part, but okay. I'm not... Not by much. So I don't think. His, you said he was in this hot, hot metal. The only thing that I'd ever seen that Richard Wilson had been in previously was Only When I Laugh, which yeah. was a sitcom based in a hospital, and he was the doctor in the hospital. So I, that was in the early 80s. Yeah, I, I think that's probably what he was best known for up until One Foot in the Grave. I, that's, I obviously am um, speaking from you know, hindsight there, but yeah. because he was a regular character in that, albeit not one of the kind of main leads, he was in every episode. Yeah. He was a, a jobbing actor. Yeah, he did. So like I said, I think during the 80s, he started to get these slightly higher profile roles. Uh, you know, he was a main role in uh, a show called High and Dry that wasn't a success, but, you know, he was cast as a as a lead, took over that principal role in Hot Metal. I think that this is a case of an actor aging into what he looks right for. Okay, that's interesting. Because even you see him in Only When I Laugh, which he would have been in his uh, early four, early to mid-40s, you know, he's already going bald. He kind of looks older than... It doesn't look like he looks older, but he has that kind of older presence, that authoritarian figure. Yeah. He was never going to be playing a young, like, chippy 35-year-old who's, you know, yeah. the love interest, you know? It's a bit like Patrick Stewart. If you watch those first episodes yeah. of uh, Star Trek... You can see he looks younger, but he still looks like a captain, if you see what I mean. Yeah, he's like, (laughs) yeah, he's looked 40 for the last 40 years. (laughs) Yeah, and I think think that's the case with Richard Wilson. I think he's just sort of finally got to an age where he was, well, better suited to his casting Uh and was finding more... Uh, more success but also you know more experience more reputation you know it all comes Mm -hmm. with time but he did uh, just to look at his career a little bit he he started quite late he worked as um he worked as a laboratory research assistant for a while and as a young man and got into acting later on uh went to rada i think he was 27 ended up in rep you know just pretty classic actor just doing a lot of rep and then just these jobbing tv roles just 
playing a doctor here, playing a yeah. you know a policeman or whatever. And yeah, like I said, it was only when he's kind of hitting uh, it, into his fifties really that it it became uh, yeah he started getting more meaty roles. So Richard Wilson, classically trained actor. Well, yeah, that's it. That's one thing I wanted to ask about Richard Wilson because. It kind of does sound like that classically trained actor. And you see him interviewed, you see the way he kind of, the way he speaks. Obviously, he's got that light Scottish accent, but he's mm. he's got that kind of, the RP nature to it and all that sort yeah. of thing. Is he a lovey? <laughs> I'm trying to, I've been trying to figure this out because he's not like a real classic stage actor. He's a jobbing TV actor. Yeah. But he has that kind of feel of a, yeah, Patrick Stewart or someone like that, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of old lovey. But he's not. You know, you think, oh, he's probably done all the classic Shakespeare things. You know, he's got that yeah. kind of feel to him, hasn't he? No, no, he's not done... No, no, he has done a Shakespeare, but it was after he was established as Victor Meldrew. It was kind of playing on that. Because he played Malvolio in Twelfth Night. It's uh, kind okay. of the obvious one to do. Yeah. But yeah, so I am i can't quite figure him out, like, what he is. <laughs> and, like, he's not from the right background to be a proper mm. lovey. He came mm. into it a little bit later and all that. You know, not everybody knows what they want to do when they grow up. You know, you might have you might have just thought, I want to act, and your career yeah. takes you where it takes you, doesn't it? Sometimes yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes you look back on the path you've travelled, and it's not it wasn't what you were planning at the start. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with being a jobbing TV actor, but it's, it's just because he seems like the kind of classic stage lovey. Maybe it's just his presence or something, but that's obviously a great presence to have. It's, it's a strong presence. I don't know how much you remember of Richard Wilson or how much you've seen of him being interviewed and stuff. But I can't quite tell. Well, in my notes, I've written, is he a knob? (laughs) Is he doing the character or is he just really an irascible old bastard? (laughs) Because he he, he always just, not even irascible, but like just a bit of a... Like, you're a bit, bit of, of a, a git, git, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't quite tell how much of it is just playing off <laughs> this kind of reputation. Well, maybe that's why that's, Maybe that's why he was so successful in the role, you know. He's a, yeah, well, a caricature of his, him, no, of his own nature. <laughs> uh, we'll come back onto him in terms of what he did afterwards and everything. But like, we should talk about Annette Crosby as well. Mm, we should. Yes, uh, Annette Crosby or the other main character in the in the show, and this is another interesting thing about One Foot in the Grave. We have two principal characters that are basically in every episode, not quite, but pretty much. Obviously, you got your lead, Victor, and then the wife, who yep. has to deal with all his crap, and she is quite the the straight man to his. Yeah. Comedy, and this is an interesting. So I'm sure you're aware of this. Like a concept of of comedy of sitcom is you either have a kind of abnormal character in a normal world or a normal character in an abnormal world. Sure. So you have conflict between your principal character and everything that's mm-hmm. going on around them, and we have that here. You could describe One Foot in the Grave as an abnormal world. Victor sees himself as the only normal person in the world, and everything around him is crazy. Yes. But he is also exacerbating it through his behaviour. And really, Margaret, his wife, is the normal person in the whole show. She's, she's the victim. She's the, she's the one who has to put up with him, and she has to put up with what the world throws at him. <laughs> yes. And by extension, her. So the neighbour characters of Angus Deaton uh, and Janet Davitsky, they they are normal. Like they're, they're just trying to get on with their life, but they have to deal with Victor Meldrew. And from their point of view, the things he is doing is crazy. But yeah. because we see it from his point of view, we sort of see the, the straight line of where it's got to. And It's not his fault. Yeah, uh, for the most part. And that creates this w- weird kind of tone to the whole thing where it's not a straightforward here's a normal character in an abnormal world, or vice versa. Mm. It kind of plays between the two. It's interesting. And there, it, it is really grounded in reality. The obvious comparison piece for me is Keeping Up Appearances. Because oh, it's okay. exactly the same period, 1990 to 95, Keeping Up Appearances ran. And that is this kind of central, very uh, heightened character. I mean, what is essentially a normal world, you know, the, 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 her family are a little bit odd, but, they're, you know, she's the heightened character. Yes. And her husband is the long-suffering kind of yes. normal one. But that plays much more simply, I think. And that's just the writing, that's Roy Clark's writing. But with One Foot in the Grave, there's, it feels much more layered. Yes. 
or, or subtle, perhaps. It's kind of a height, slightly heightened reality, but it's all believable. I would say that a difference between keeping up appearances and one foot in the grave is the, the, the sympathy you have with the main character. So Richard Wilson, irascible as he is, sorry, Victor Meldrew, mm-hmm. he, you have sympathy because you've seen what's unfolded and yeah. how he is a victim of the circumstances. Hmm. Whereas Hyacinth Bouquet, you know, yeah. she's, she's a bit of a bitch, really. And, <laughs> she's, and she's not particularly sympathetic. And yes, the world still yeah. is happening to her, but she kind of deserves it. Whereas mm. with Victor Meldrew, he doesn't react well, but you sympathize with him. He doesn't, always, he doesn't deserve what the world throws at him. Yeah, you're right. I think it is down to the sympathy for the character. I think you've you've really hit the nail on the head there, because the the worst thing that the victor does really is respond. Like mm. he he goes headlong into confrontation. Yeah. I just thought about this last night. Actually, I was walking down from the shops, and there's this young youth, and he just had a plastic bottle, drinking from it, and literally just threw it into the ground. And like, I wanted to go and say, "Hey, mate, I think you dropped something there." Yeah. But I also live in South London. I didn't want to get stabbed, so I just didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whereas whereas Victor Meldrew would have said something and then yeah. they would have, you know, p- pulled him. his cap over his <laughs> eyes and you know or something, you know, like yeah. well. That is his weakness is to respond. But of course, he's doing and saying all the things you want to say. Yes. When someone someone because you gives you, you bad customer that. service or someone does a job badly and you just want to complain and moan, but you're too polite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I definitely get the impression that it's very much David Renwick's mouthpiece in that sense. <laughs> like ah. from things I've heard with him, like he's a real neurotic. He's a massive thing about littering. Like that is a big thing for him. Right. That's interesting. There was a couple of times when I was watching episodes of One Foot in the Grave this week where I thought of the Michael Douglas character in Falling Down. (laughs) Where he he snaps and he, you know, he just takes it all out on the world. And it's obviously a little more lighthearted than that. But again, that is that film, the the main character in that we are sympathetic with, even though he is, you know, an unhinged criminal. (laughs) But, but (laughs) you know, we have sympathy with him because he all, you know, he snaps and he says the things that we all kind of want to say. So that's what, that's what Victor Meldrew is. He's how, he's our, he's our subconscious mouthpiece. Yeah, and I think that's why he's he's so likable, even though he does kind of foolish things sometimes. But you, you can also sympathise with like, oh my god, imagine being married to this guy, <laughs> and you can't even leave the house without him getting into a fight with someone. Um, yeah, so just to quickly touch on Annette Crosby, uh, hmm. another jobbing actor with decades of experience. She was about fifty-five or something when the show started. You know, she has played a lot of, like, Shakespearean roles, queens, lots of queens she's played. She's <laughs> she's notable for kind of what made her career. In 1971, she played Catherine of Aragon in uh, okay. um, Six Wives of Henry VIII. She won the, the TV BAFTA for Best Actress for that. Oh. And then also won it again a few years later for playing Queen Victoria in something. So kind of those cla- and, and she she reminds me a bit of Angela Lansbury in that she's kind of always been a middle-aged woman like that's how it feels yeah yeah but in I think when she played Queen Victoria she plays Queen Victoria from like 23 to 82 or whatever when she died like she she played this full range of a, of a thing in this in this drama mm-hmm. I pretty much only know her from one foot in the grave I think that's probably true for most people apart from one or two other maybe TV appearances. Yeah, she, exactly that. You, you kind of see her pop up in an episode of something. She was very yeah. recently in um, Afterlife, Ricky Gervais' yes, program. Yeah. And, you know, she she was a comedy old lady swearing. That was that was the term. Yeah, yeah. She did very one well. joke, one joke ten times. It worked beautifully. Well, that's much more Ricky Gervais' problem. <laughs> yeah. But the, I've I've seen a few interviews with her and stuff, and I've got to say I really like her, like as a person, how she comes across. Okay. She just seems like a real kind of no-nonsense, very dry sense of humour. I watched this clip of the two of them on Loose Women. And this is from a few years ago. I just found it on YouTube, you know, a little interview with them. So they're both early 80s or something. And she's obviously a little bit deaf, like she can't quite hear. And so there's always this kind of slight delay when she before she responds. But then it comes across as really great comic timing. <laughs> and, and like, obviously, they've got a kind of a, a really nice energy between them. And they're kind of back and forth and things. But also then they ask them, oh, you know, the show finished 15 years ago. Like, how often do you see each other? And like, I don't think we've seen each other since it ended. (laughs) 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 um, So it was quite sweet, really. But they'd obviously just like clicked straight back into the energy. Like old friends. 
Yeah, but not particularly close, it turns out. <laughs> Offset. <laughs> Ten years, Annette, together. What? Ten years you were together on the show. Um, <sighs> right. <laughs> how, how often do you manage to see each other after that? It's quite often hard to keep in touch, isn't we it? We don't when remember when we last yeah. met. No, no, no. <laughs> Basically, we didn't keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> because he lived in North London and I lived in South. Uh, and as far as he was concerned, I lived in South Back and beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Wimbledon. I mean, where's Wimbledon? <laughs> well, before we before we start to talk about, we, we watched one specific episode, which we're going to talk yeah. about from series three. Mm-hmm. But can you just tell us about you know how many series it ran for, and then because because there was a big gap, wasn't there? There was. Uh, would you tell me? There was several series, and then there was a gap, and they made some more. Yeah. So they cracked out the first two series uh, within the same year. So they did one very early, 1990, and then one later in 1990. Hmm. It, it wasn't doing like hugely well, but obviously well enough that it, they gave it a bit more time. They kept going with it, which certainly happened a lot more back then. You wouldn't really get that now. Um, but then when they got repeated, they they managed to pick a bit of an audience. You know, it's just one of those things, right place, right time. It, it caught an audience. And so season three, which is about a year later did uh, did a lot better. And then, yeah, it turned out season four the next year, just pretty much one series a year as standard. And then it slowed down after that. Mm. They did a Christmas special uh, that year, Christmas 93, One Foot in the Algarve. It was a feature length, <laughs> full on, the Mel yeah. go on holiday special. On like, the buses on holiday. Yeah, but on a TV budget. <laughs> right. Uh, then... So, yeah, they, they followed that with another Christmas special and then season five. So, basically, season five was early 95. So, pretty standard, five series in five years. That's mm-hmm. kind of the not, that was the full run yep. as you would expect it to be. Then it slowed down. So, they did a Christmas special in 95, yeah. a Christmas special in 96, a Christmas special in 97. So it was just one episode, but these were like hour long episodes. An hour yeah, long so episode. Only Fools and Horses did that for years, didn't they? Just just one yeah, a year. Yeah, yeah. So that was 97, the last one. And then they took some time off and they came back in 2000 with a full series, six right. episodes. And that was the closer. Did they sort of make any reference to the fact that, oh gosh, we're five years older now? Was was there was there any difference in the, the, the setting, the scenarios? No, I would say basically not. It's a remarkably consistent show. I yeah. think that's to its credit. I think you can watch an episode from series one, an episode from the last series, and it's you're going to get the same basic thing. They look a bit older. Annette Crosby particularly has aged. You know, mm. Richard Wilson, because he looked 10 years older than he was anyway, sure. kind of hasn't very much. But they're still doing the same thing, and they're consistent with it. And one of the things I do really like about One Foot in the Grave is that they we have these two principal characters. And we have these ancillary characters, a couple of neighbours, a friend, you know, Mm -hmm. but they are used sparingly. Mm -hmm. They're in about maybe a third of the episodes total. They're not thinking, oh, everyone likes Mrs. Warboys, let's get her in every episode. Oh, let's get Angus Deaton in every episode. No one ever said that. (laughs) And and I think that really works to its credit. It, it, It doesn't feel like it's pandering to an audience. It feels like it's doing its thing. And that I think that's why it stays so consistent throughout. So, yes, I uh, I chose an episode from Season 3. Series 3, mm-hmm. Episode 6, which is the last one of Series 3. The worst horror of all. Yes. Not a particularly standout episode, especially, and there are a few standout episodes in this series, but I do like to pick one that is a bit more, you know, run-of-the-mill, like, show us what the, the, the show is. Mm-hmm. So... What were your uh, first thoughts? Any any immediate things? Jamie? I enjoyed it. I, I I enjoyed it. Like you say, it wasn't um you know it wasn't the episode where he picks up the dog thinking it's the phone. It was yeah, uh, yeah. you know it was Classic. just a normal episode. But I really enjoyed it. The, the the advantage of that is I I you know I didn't remember it. I didn't know what was coming, so I could just enjoy it on its own terms. Yeah. What I thought was it was very good at setting up premises and setting up little little problems you know down the line. So yeah, you know we set up. Mrs. Warboy's, I'm not clear, is it her cousin, Wilfred, who's a little bit, we're not exactly sure what's wrong with him, but he seems a little bit forgetful. Maybe he's got a little bit of dementia. We've got the skip. He's scratching his ankle because he's got these flea bites. Mm -hmm. Uh, We got the the scene with Ronnie and Mildred when they come and knock on the door and they're avoiding them. 
And you've got the window cleaner who keeps appearing and reappearing. And these are all just little threads which are sewn into the episode early on. Some mm. of them come back and go away and come back and come out and go away. And then some of them you've forgotten about until bang, they pay off right at the end. Uh, that was really yeah. well seeded. Like nothing clanged. Well, I, as I understand it, David Rainwick liked to kind of find a conclusion point and work backwards and go, right, how could I get him into this position? Mm. You know, like, oh, he's buried up to his neck and there's a plant put on his head. Like, yes. how, how, how do I get there? What circumstances could possibly get him there? And so then he's working backwards. And obviously, probably the, the, other, the other most famous thing that David Renwick wrote is Jonathan Creek, uh, yes. which obviously works on a similar a murder mystery. You kind of start with the end and, and work backwards, you know, try and figure it out so. as you go along. So that's obviously how he likes to write. And I do agree that there are things that are set up and they pay off. I will say, though, that I think, and this is very telling of the show in general, but particularly the first few series, he gets a bit better at this. It feels like a series of sketches. Mm. Now, he is from a sketch writing background, so that does add up. But it it feels like disparate elements that are are joined together, but are joined together with a thread. There's a thread to join them together, not, uh, you know, (laughs) a a mighty... uh, I see what you're saying. Uh, thing. So let's just go through there and we, we can kind of look at that as we go along. So um, we, we start out in a hospital waiting room. Unusual start. You know, this is a, a show, basically it has established set of the house and they do shoot a lot of stuff in location, but this is a set uh, and it's a hospital waiting room and Victor himself is totally out of it. He's drugged up yeah, and we get this kind of little bit of backstory as to how they've ended up there. Again, it's the end of a story, really. Like this yes. could be an entire plot, couldn't it? <laughs> it's, but it's, always... an interesting, it's an interesting scene because, in hindsight, having watched the episode, you could do without that scene in terms of the plot. You know, mm-hmm. it sets up that he's got the shed in the skip, and that sets up that gag for later. But we could have just seen him putting bits of wood in the skip. You know, we exactly. don't need that scene. So it's in there as a sketch. It's in there on its own merits as a funny scene. Those two are talking about him. He's delirious. And they're talking about him like he's a kid. And, you know, it's funny. It's a funny scene. But it's not necessary for the episode, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and like you said, it all threads in. Yes, it sets up the skip thing later. Yes, it sets up the window cleaner thing as well, mm-hmm. because so she drives off. But again, you could easily just make that happen another way. He, It feels like Renwick has these ideas and then figures out a way to kind of patchwork them together. Yeah. Rather than coming up with a whole idea and then working on that. Partly why I wanted to come back to One Foot in the Grave is because I recently rewatched the whole of Jonathan Creek. I went through all of that. And there's a lot of stuff in there where it's... Obviously, there's a main murder mystery and a thing to solve. But there's quite a lot of just like a side thing where, mm. oh, here's solve that, you know? And it's like just a little thing. And it feels like, oh, he's had an idea there. For that could yeah. be a mystery. But then has gone, do you know what? That's not going to be big enough. I'm, I'm, but I'll throw it in there somewhere. And I get that a lot with One Foot in the Grave as well, where it's like a little sk- skit or a scene... But then he's gone, oh, I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to sort of tail end it. Yes. So one of the things they say about writing is you should kill your babies just because you've got a great idea. If it doesn't fit, then get rid of it. And maybe Mm. there's no one telling him that. Well, he sounds like he's killing his babies, as in he's got about six babies in each episode. Yeah, (laughs) he could probably do with getting rid of one or two of them. (laughs) But he could also take it out and and expand it. So let's do this episode kind of chronologically, and we'll come into that. But yeah, so we have this sketch, and I think... It it shows a confidence in your characters that your main principal character, you're starting off the first five minutes, he he's just delirious. He's not acting as you expect that character to act. That's a confidence in the character, I think, that people aren't just coming to, you know, do the catchphrase and all that sort of thing. So I, I quite like that. You, you've got confidence in Margaret and Mrs. Warboys to carry the scene. That's no problem. And then... And again, as I was talking about working backwards and, and really setting up the bit, we go to so much effort to demonstrate that Mrs. Warboys is driving a car that she's not accustomed to. She says that, basically, and she has yeah. trouble with it. So she accidentally reverses into this thing. The guy, the window cleaner falls on top of the car and then she's driving along. Why doesn't she Why doesn't she feel that there's a weight on the car because she's not used to the car? Yeah. All these things that I think in, for example, Keeping Up Appearances... They wouldn't care. It's slapstick comedy. Yeah, drive your reverse into the thing and there's someone on the roof. It doesn't matter. I think that's Renwick, uh, David Renwick's influence. Like, I think he's quite precise about what he's doing and he wants everything to work. 
I listened to some commentaries on uh, on a few of the episodes. David Renwick and Richard Wilson did a few. And one of the things they were talking about was like, he receives this parcel and they put it on the kitchen table, but then they had to take the things out of the parcel onto the table and it was too big. So they had to have a reason why he put the parcel on the chair instead of the table. So they made sure there were some shopping bags on the table. So he had to put it on the chair so that then Margaret quickly moves the shopping bags and they can open it up onto the table. But it all looks natural. It all looks free flowing. Yeah. And they, they said they spent like half an hour in rehearsals, like working that out, how that would work. And it's that sort of thing, which it seems like small things, but I think it genuinely makes a big difference to how it's symptomatic of, a, of an attitude, isn't it? I mean, you know that that specific thing. Where does the where does the box go? Doesn't matter. What yeah. matters is the attitude behind this needs to be real. And it's yeah, it's exactly that. I think it's a sense of reality. Whereas in just to use it as an example, keeping up appearances isn't as concerned with that. And we'll just be, look, it's a sitcom, stupid things happen, it's fine. Mm. But I think that makes such a big difference. I, I, and and I think, yeah, it, it heightens the reality of the situation. Uh, so Mrs. Warboy basically ends up with this gentleman on her the roof of her car, she doesn't even realise. We set up Wilf, you know, he's there. But what's interesting about Wilf is that we get told later on he's just come out of hospital and he has problems yeah. with his memory, and that's mentioned. But it's mentioned ten minutes later. So initially, she comes home and she's talking to Wilf. And you're like, something's not quite right about Wilf. I'm not sure what's happening here. Mm. They don't just explain it. It's like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll unfold that later. There's no rush. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah. yeah, he's not quite a doddery old man, but he's just had an operation or something. He's just a yeah. bit out of sorts. Yeah. And obviously, that, 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 so that we can do the mistaken identity thing later. That's why. Yeah. But what I mean is, it's not, it's not just rolled out for you. Oh, Wilf, you, what, here's what you need to know about Wilf. You know, it's just slowly revealed in its own time. And yeah, that's, yeah, that yeah. works well. The next bit, we actually see Victor and Margaret in their home. And just to, to give you a bit of background here, um, in the first series, they, you know, built a set of the house, as you do, mm. classic sitcom set with, a you know, three walls with the audience facing it. Uh, then they filmed some location things in, uh, in a street, you know, in Eastbourne or somewhere like that. Yeah. And then the person who owned the house, I can't remember if it, if it changed hands and someone else bought it or the person who owned the house just went, oh, you want to film here for a second series? Uh, that'll cost much more, please. <laughs> like they realized they kind of had them over a barrel, charged huh. much more. So they just went, well, no, uh, the BBC aren't paying that. So the, the first episode of series two is them coming home from holiday to discover that their house has been destroyed. And <laughs> nice. I, t- I remember that episode actually. I remember it at the time. It was a great way to start a series, but I didn't know yeah. that's why. I didn't know it was just to stick two fingers up at the, ser- the end of the original <laughs> set. <laughs> great. And it is. It's quite telling of David Renwick's writing. He's not afraid to kind of do quite big dramatic things. Like he will throw death into a show, like quite happily. He, he likes his dark topics. So seeing them go through this process of basically arriving home to a pile of rubble. <laughs> and all their possessions gone, but still making, giving, giving you laughs. He he does love his tragedy, does David Renwick. But yes, the the principal reason was because they wanted to change the set. <laughs> they needed to change the location. Brilliant. So on top of changing the the street location, the set was redesigned, and this, according to the people involved, was quite a revolutionary thing at the time. So I'm going to have to go on a bit of a tangent here. I'd like to talk about Susan Belbin. Ah, so Susan Belbin, I saw her name. She directed pretty much all of the episodes, didn't she? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, she sort of, the last few, last series, last few specials, she basically retired. Uh-huh. But yeah, ultimately, it was her show as director slash producer. Yeah. Now, I, I managed to find an interview with her in which she pretty much gave us her life story, which was quite interesting. And it is like a proper kind of old school story. She's uh, she's also Scottish. There's a lot of Scottish people involved in this. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, she was born in 1948 and, uh, you know, went to technical college to do um, kind of theatre stuff and got a job sweeping the floors at a theatre. Um, then got a job as a runner at BBC Glasgow, I think it was. And just slowly, slowly worked her way up till she was a floor manager. Ended up moving to London. I guess because that's where the work was. Yeah. And she was a production manager and a floor manager for the um, on-set shoots of a lot of David Croft stuff. So like, hello, hello, and uh, are you being served? And yeah, and she kind of said, I'm interested in directing. And David Croft sort of 
So he's like, fine, I'll give you the chance, give you opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so uncredited, she directed certain scenes of Say Hello, Hello, or Are You Being Served? So she would be the stage manager, and then they'd come to shoot all the canteen stuff for Are You Being Served? And he'd go, right, you're directing the canteen scenes. So she'd go up to the director's box and direct them and direct the cameras and the actors. And then she'd go back down and be studio manager again. So that is apparently in the 80s, like that's how you got your experience. (laughs) You got your chance. And so, you know, with this experience under her belt, someone obviously knew what she was doing and and came to her. And her first like credited directing job is series three of uh, Only Fools and Horses. Oh, right. Okay. Pretty big thing. And again, Only Fools and Horses was a show that kind of grew from the first couple of series and wasn't... I was going to say that. How big was Only Fools and Horses in series three? It was similar. You know, it it, it, it it sort of just gaining a bit of traction. She says quite uh, plainly in her interview that that was the series that won the BAFTA. <laughs> you know, she was like, after I came and what? Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it, got, it got noticed. So off the back of that, she was brought in to make bread. So she was the okay. the force behind that, certainly the first couple of series. And then her next kind of big job where it was like, here's a thing for you to shepherd in, all the, like it's your thing, was One Foot in the Grave. Uh-huh. And this uh, was, you know, pretty standard. They, you know, you give it to a producer director and they kind of handle everything. But David Renwick said, you know, he didn't know who they were going to give it to. And fortunately, it was someone who was happy to have him involved because he was there. It seems like he was on, on the location, on shooting most of the time. He was in rehearsals and he was really heavily involved in the production. He wasn't just churning mm-hmm. out scripts and sending them to him. And we'll come back to that in a second. I just want to talk about Susan Bellman because one of the things she did, apparently, this is her pioneering thing, the idea of actually constructing a full set of location. So mm-hmm. you'll notice in the episode we watched, the, the second house they live in, they go straight through from the living room. It's kind of a living room, dining room, open area. That's a bit facing yeah. the audience. But then they'll go through into the kitchen. They can go through into the corridor and there's a mm-hmm. stair, staircase and stuff. And whereas in normally you would have people go out of the door and then you go, right, cut okay, we're going over to this set and you move over six feet Mm. to where the kitchen set is and you go, right, action. Obviously, it disturbs the flow of the comedy. Instead of doing that, they just have them go straight through into the kitchen, continue the scene. Now, the disadvantages of that are the actual stage audience can't see because there's walls in the way, but they can watch it on the monitors. They just have a feed Mm. from the cameras. So you're still getting that natural laugh track. Uh, Other disadvantages are you have to light everything really nicely and have cameras in position ready to go and all that. It's just a bit more Mm. technically difficult. And as you're turning around to shoot the kitchen from the other side, you're seeing through the door, in which case you just look straight into the audience. So you have Mm -hmm. to have someone ready with a fake wall just to wheel in quickly in place. And so it's a bit more of a technical management going on, but ultimately it makes the script and the actors flow better. It's more realistic. You know, the thing, if you think about as you say, the traditional sets, you might have two or three sets on a stage all facing out to the audience. I mean, yep. that is replicating a theatre. And yep. and that's understandable because from its early days, that's what television was. It was just the theatre being filmed. And some, some, some elements of it still are. But yep. obviously, you know, it's, it's been a while now. TV's been up and running. And so it evolves its own forms and its own, it, it, its own mechanics. But it's still based in theatre. That's where it has evolved mm. from. Especially in in that classic three camera kind of sitcom mm. with the live audience, not say The Office or something like that, but uh, that your classic sitcom, yeah, definitely still stage based. So apparently that is the way things are done uh, now, and it's right. much more common to have a kind of fully built set. And Susan Belbin was the one who pioneered that in series two of One Foot in the Grave. There you go. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Sitcom history for you. And, and and Susan Belbin, she went on to do most of Only Fools and Horses. She was also producer for Jonathan Creek uh, in the early days. And judging from her sort of talking about it, I think she burned out. I think she may have had like a total, like, just burnout, breakdown kind of thing. Because right. <laughs> when she was about 50, she she retired and, you know, hasn't really worked since. And obviously doesn't need to work. She's obviously comfortable. But even then, in, in One Foot in the Grave, uh, the woman who took over, Christine Gernon, was... Her assistant, essentially, she'd been working with her for years I see. and had worked on One Foot in the Grave in a different capacity. So it made sense in terms of a continuity. A succession of plan. Yeah. In this case, because David Renwick was so hands-on, 
I, I think he was much more of the creative force, and mm. I, I don't know exactly what the, the dynamic was, but with Susan Belbin, I think she was more concerned with how it was all filmed rather than necessarily working with the actors, because I think that script is so tight. And that's another thing that gets mentioned a lot when people talk about David Renwick. He is extremely precise about his scripts. Everything's in there for a reason. Yes, and he does not encourage in any way improvisation mm. or ad-libbing. <laughs> and... To the point of, um, <laughs> I was listening to one of these commentaries, and obviously they're doing a bit. Of, they're watching the thing and talking about it. Angus Deaton delivered a line in a particular way, and this is I don't know, fifteen years after they're doing the commentary, fifteen years after it was recorded. And David Renwick goes, hmm, "Unusual stress on that line. That's not how I would have done it." <laughs> like he can't help himself. <laughs> like he put the stress on the wrong word in the sentence, and now he's. <laughs> That is, of course, until they popped round last Sunday to finalise one or two details and were somewhat taken aback, not so much by the hideous sight of a naked man dangling outside my office window, as by the hideous sight of what was dangling from the naked man. (laughs) Interesting stress on the word from there. I don't think is where I would have put it personally, but Angus was always quite... um, He could be quite, quite sort of wayward with his... Yes, but nevertheless, you could say character worked. driven. Yes, character could. It worked, and it got the laugh. Perhaps a stronger lock on the door of your laboratory might stop the stress on man. <laughs> Do you know what? I've heard a lot of people talking about David Renwick, and it really comes across. You know, if you're at a funeral and someone's not probably not that a nicer person, but nobody wants to say anything bad about him, so they're trying yeah, to spin everything to, positive. You have to read the codes. <laughs> it's like, it's it like reading really... school reports. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly keeps us on our toes. Yeah, he's a real perfectionist. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think he may be a bit of a, a, a git himself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But the writing is strong, and that's how you get away with that in that context. If if you're persistent about what you're doing, but you're right, mm. you're going to get away with it long term. You know. Yeah. yeah. Shall we return to our episode? Yes. Yes. Sorry, on. Well, we return to it's the next morning and Victor's putting the bits of shed in the skip and we get the setup for the skip. Uh, you know, there's always a ratty mattress. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, and in this scene, this is another good example of something I'd like to talk about. And again, I think it comes from that kind of very persistent and precise rehearsal process. The characters in this show always do in business. It's always business. They're never still. And this... This little scene here is a really good example. He walks in and he gets a beer out of the fridge. He gets the glass out of the cupboard. He pours the beer. He goes into the room. You should say that. I noticed that. I wrote down. He's Why is he pouring a beer into that little glass? And it's, yes. And I wondered if that was going to be something that might pay off later. It doesn't. But no. But it's an interesting that you observed that as well. It would have been very easy for the characters just to be talking. But he's, yes, yes there's business. And he goes through Margaret's ironing, you know. The, but that is this show up and down. Like they're always doing business. It's never mm. just we're delivering lines. And again, it just adds to that sense of reality. It gives it character, mm. and it gives it precision. I think that's kind of really what it, it is. Can I talk about the skip joke? Because yeah, I, you know, I mentioned earlier the script is well organized and it has these setups and payoffs. And the skip is probably the biggest payoff. You know, if people haven't seen the episode. He, he's got a skip and he says, oh, in the morning, there'll probably be a bloody mattress in there. Someone always leaves a mattress in your skip when you've got one out. Yeah. And and you're expecting this punchline to come. You're expecting the pay. Oh, there's going to be a mattress there. And the punchline delivers. He wakes up the next morning, looks out the window and there's a sodding car. Someone has parked <laughs> a car in this skip. It's, <laughs> they've set up an obvious joke. They've really made themselves a hostage to fortune because you can see it coming and it still (laughs) punches you. It still gets you. They managed to they managed to over deliver on something that would be so easy to fail. It's really impressive. It is great. And then of course there's the second punchline. There's a bloody mattress. He opens the the car car. door and there's a mattress in it. (laughs) Which is a beautiful like backup punch. (laughs) Exactly. It's a topper. But but you can you can see what's coming and it still makes you laugh. It's it's really well executed. And mm. it's it's a high risk manoeuvre. It's a high risk manoeuvre to say, look, we're gonna make this joke now. Are you ready? We are going to make a joke and you can see it coming. Are you yeah. ready? And they still make you laugh. It's really good. It's really brave and, and well executed. But again, 
it's a sketch. It's a sketch about a a man having a skip and someone puts a car in it. We never know where the car comes from. There's never any resolution to it. We don't know where how he gets rid of it. That's it true, actually, it's yeah. a standalone I never, sketch. I never gave a lot of thought to where the car came from. <laughs> so I wanted to get it in there, but then you never really think about it. Again. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But it doesn't but matter. It is I haven't thought about it until you just asked the question. But before we get to the actual reveal of the car, we have other things set up. We have the fact set up that first of all, he's messing about with flea bites. Yeah, his ankle scratching. It's like, well, that's going to pay off later, I'm sure, because mm-hmm. it just seems totally irrelevant. Then he casually mentions that he's starting a job on mm-hmm. Monday. That's a whole new plot line. We're a third of the way through the episode now, and that's like, oh, that's a whole new thing. Yeah. And it is just dropped in at that point. It, 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 it's not relevant to that scene. It's mm-hmm. dropped in because we need it for later. Then, before we even have a chance to think about that, we get into this slapstick routine mm-hmm. where Ronnie and Mildred, who are like people they've met on holiday and are boring and they're trying to not have any contact with them. They're kind of, They come back and forth a few episodes. They're knocking on the door, and so Victor and Margaret have to hide and pretend they're not in. And this is a nice scene. It's, 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 this is about as slapstick and sitcom comedy as One Foot in the Grave gets. Yeah. Like I say, it is kind of re- always really anchored in reality. But this is a little bit silly. I think the best example of that is when he decides he's got to go and try and turn off the bathroom light and he's not going to have long to do it yeah and margaret kind of says good luck kisses him in a kind of he's going off to war kind of way yeah it's a deliberately overblown thing for comedy value and it does just not work in the yeah it's just cartoonish and it they get away with it but that's as far as they'll go with it and i think that's true for the show in general like they'll just push that line oh no what is it Mildred's going around the back. But I think I've left the bathroom light on. Oh, my God, that's it. They've got us in a pincer movement. <laughs> They're finished. They'll be here till three o'clock in the morning showing us pictures of their loft conversion. <laughs> right, I'm going to go for it. Are you mad? You'll never make it. I've got about ten seconds. It's now or never. Right. Good luck. <laughs> and Ronnie and Mildred themselves are kind of sitcom characters. It's like they're the sitcom neighbours who are coming around yeah. and they have yeah. to avoid them. But it, but it is a nice scene. I think it's very relatable, um, like hiding from someone behind the setting. And of course it pays off at the, the end of the episode. Is He, walk, he mm-hmm. walks home after losing his job and opens the door and there they are. Yeah, so. it does pay off later. But, but you have made me think as we, as we've been having this conversation... It feels like, and I don't mean your point about it's a series of sketches, yes. It feels like a series of sketches intertwined. Mm -hmm. You know, any episode of a good sitcom will have a main plot and some subplots. It feels like this is four subplots. (laughs) Yes. That's a very good way of putting it. That is a very good way of putting it. And that is not unusual for this episode. That is very typical of the show in general, Mm. particularly the first few series. The first two series, it is just, it just feels like totally disparate storylines that is just throwing at the screen. It's a telling factor of the show. And I think it's very telling of Renwick as well. As I say, having recently watched Jonathan Creek, there's a lot of that in Jonathan Creek as well. Mm. And to say Jonathan Creek should be a very tightly written murder mystery we're all leading mm. to a conclusion here there is a lot of ancillary stuff his magician the magician he works for adam klaus pretty much anything with adam klaus in for the vast majority of it is not relevant to the plot whatsoever it's just comic relief and that's fine it works but it does feel frustrating there is so much stuff in in that that doesn't work i think you get away with it in sitcom a lot more because you know ultimately we're not it's not building to a big finish in the same way, usually. But it, it, I definitely feel it watching this. And I think for someone who is so precise in his writing, I think his structure is just all over the place. <laughs> but I think he's just got a lot of ideas. He strings them together. And like you say, there's a thread there. There's a thread that makes it all string together. But it's a thread. It's a single thread. What's really interesting to me, Alan, is everything you've just said is is, is dead right. I don't disagree with a word of it. And yet, until you said it, I, you know, half an hour ago, I said, oh, it's all really tight and everything, everything fits. And so it works. Mm. The point is that, you know, although when you analyze it and pick it apart, it's got those problems. It works. As a half hour of television, I watched it and I enjoyed it. Yeah. And I I think 
this is the last episode of series three. I think he's already getting stronger at it by this point. Mm. The first series is very loose. But there are a couple of standout episodes. It's probably a good place to talk about them. Um, and this is apparently something that Renwick and, and Susan Belbin kind of challenged each other to, to some extent of like, let's write an episode, like a real time episode, all set in one location. And then they do an episode like, let's write an episode where it's just Victor on his own in the house and he's just doing business for 30 minutes. And so there's a, a couple of episodes like that. I did like notice, because we watched, I've watched a, a few episodes uh, this week. And there's quite a lot of Victor talking to himself mm. or, or um, soliloquizing, if we mm-hmm. want to get flash about it. You know, he's, he's really thinking aloud rather than talking to himself. That is a skill of Richard Wilson's, I think, to do that well uh, mm. and to, to sell it. Because it doesn't feel like a character talking to themselves because we need to get some plot line. Obviously, it's good writing as well. Uh, I think it really works, actually, very nicely. And so there is an episode... I'm not going to remember off the top of my head which series or whatever it is, but it's called The Trial, and uh, Victor's on jury service, so he has to be waiting in at home in case mm. they call him and say, we need you. That's basically the setup. He can't go out. Margaret's at work. Yeah. And so he's just doing stuff. You know, he's on the phone. He rings someone up to complain about something. Mm-hmm. He looks out the window and something happens. You know, he goes up to the bathroom, and then he forgets why he was there, and he has to come back down. It's nice. It works really well. It's well acted. It's well written. And there's another couple of episodes that all happen in real time. So there's one that's called Timeless Time, I think. And it's Victor and Margaret in bed and they can't sleep. And so they're just talking to each other. There's another one which is famously, it's set in a traffic jam. The whole thing takes place in a car. There's occasional interaction with people like in the cars going next to them. But essentially it's just those two and then Mrs. Warboys comes in. It's another standout episode, very well known. And these bottle episodes, you know, often... Historically, they've been written because they ran out of money. Mm. That's the case, or has Renwick no. done it because he wanted to challenge himself? If anything, it probably costs more because you're out on location. The, the car one was out on location yeah, yeah. with loads of cars and extras who were just there sitting in a traffic jam, not doing anything, okay. but you had to pay them. And it took him ages to film it. But I, I, no, I think this is on a sitcom budget. You're not, you're never working with much anyway. It's not like they've got an episode with loads of explosions in. Uh, it, it's, it was just a challenge and it seemed like him and Susan Belbin kind of would kind of push each other a little bit. And that's nice. But I think they're some of the best episodes and not just because I guess, you know, they, they stand out because they're unusual. I think the writing is a lot tighter because he's not having to say, everything has to flow in like one conversation. In real time. And I think it works a lot better for it. Um, and perhaps that is just symptomatic of his writing. And that's all we have time for this week. Please do come back next time when we will continue our discussion on this episode and we'll have a look at what happened to everyone after One Foot in the Grave. Where did they go next? There's going to be a bit of a discussion about Eric Idol. So come back for that next week. In the meantime, do get in touch at BritcomPod. That's on Instagram or Twitter. Until next time, goodbye.